Welcome back to Judgment Decision Making. I'm Dr. Padilla. Now we're going to talk about availability. Availability heuristic relies on how easy it is to recall examples when evaluating a specific topic. Note that we've discussed availability before. I talked about this YouTuber and just YouTubers generally, um, but in particular, uh, one young woman named Emma Chamberlain and how part of her success is just how frequently she's producing media and getting that out in front of everyone. And the more she's in front of everyone, the easier it will be for people to remember her name and her face. And then people will tend to like the content that she produces more. For example, she has a new Vogue makeup tutorial out and she is, you know, not a makeup artist. And the people who are generally on these Vogue makeup tutorials are really famous um, models or actresses or singers that are really known for fantastic makeup. But she is on here as well. And it's part of this campaign to always be in front of you, always be buying for your attention. And that will lead to you having a more positive opinion of her and the things that she does. Um, similarly, I've talked about this before, but I noticed this a lot with pop songs. For example, I've never really liked Justin Bieber, please don't come after me. Um, but what happens is when Justin Bieber comes out with a new song, I'm like, meh. But then I hear it over and over and over. I'm like, oh, well, maybe it's not so bad. And then, you know, I'm not even noticing and I'm singing along to it, right? Because when stuff is played on the radio and when it's kind of constantly exposed to you, that's when you have the tendency to like it more. That's why big name artists like Justin Bieber, Taylor Swift, many others, they're trying to get high in the algorithm for what songs are presented to you on things like Spotify and YouTube and other platforms that have an algorithm for presenting new music to you. You'll notice if you don't um, pay much attention and you just let like a Spotify playlist go, at some point you might get a Taylor Swift song, even if that's not music that you ever listen to because the algorithm will be slowly trying to nudge you in that direction and expose you to that information. Okay, so here's an interesting example, and I want you to think which one of these two words is real, the one on the left or the one on the right. Now, you might recognize the one on the left. It is a made up word from Donald Trump, and you might not know the one on the right, but it's the real word. It means to gulp down quickly and greedily, but it's very, very uncommon. Now, I recognize that this probably didn't work on you, but I would love to actually replicate the original study. And what they did is they had random, not random, I think they were Turkish words that they put in a college newspaper and kind of just in a random place so that lots of people had exposure to a Turkish word. And then they asked later if these words, you know, had positive or negative associations. And they found that the words that were most exposed to people that they put up most frequently, people had the most positive associations with those words, even though they didn't know the meaning of the Turkish word. So that's to say that when you're presented with something random over and over and over again, you start to have positive associations with it. So I thought I would see if I could get um, people to think that kofefi was more of a word, uh, more likely to be a word than uh, zert Ex excerpts? Ex I'm not sure how to say that, uh, but I realize it probably didn't work. I'd really love to kind of replicate this in some capacity though. Okay, so the way that this availability heuristic works is that sometimes a salient event that attracts your attention will be easier to retrieve from memory. This is the bombing of the Twin Towers. And a lot of people have that as a very important salient event that happened because it was very traumatic and because it's been repeated over and over and over in the media. So it's so easy to recall that as a terrorist attack. So when you think about things like the likelihood of a terrorist attack, they can seem more likely because it's pretty easy to remember a situation like this or, you know, people storming the Capitol building. 
Those events are so vivid in our memory, it may seem like a terrorist attack is more likely to happen, even if it's not, just simply because it's easier to remember those types of events. Okay, let's try some other examples. I would like you to list three instances in which you were a good student. Just try to think in your mind three times you're a good student. What type of student are you? Good, bad, and different? If you can think of three, you're probably a good student, right? You feel good about yourself? Okay, now try to think of 12. Can you do it? If you're really a good student, you should be able to think of 12, right? So are you a good student or not? <laughs> this comparison suggests that three things are easier to remember than 12. So if there's a, a cognitive fluency, if, it, if it's easy for you to remember those items, you will most likely have a positive association with that information. If it's hard, if you have to remember 12 and then you can't, then you might think negatively about the situation because it's hard to remember those things. In terms of cognitive ease and fluency, multiple things contribute to this. So I'd like you to frown and list three instances in which you were kind to a friend. Give it a shot right now. Try to frown. My bad frown. Hard? Easy? Okay, just do the exact same thing, but with a smile. Smile, even if it's fake, smile. Try to list three instances in which you were a kind friend. Now, the first one where you were frowning was probably harder than the second one, right? You kind of could tell the difference there. It's partly because we have a feedback loop with our body. This thing called embodied cognition means that our body is giving us information in the world. And if we're frowning and thinking about something positive, there's a disconnect there. So it's harder for us to do a think of positive thoughts while feeling negative in our body. Um, when we smile, there is cognitive fluency. It's easier to think of things because we're happy, we're smiling, and it's easier to recall those positive instances of us being kind friends. Okay, let's look at a few more examples of how strong an effect that availability heuristic has on us. I'm going to play you some songs and I want you to tell me what product or thing is associated with the sounds that you hear. I'm stuck what do you think that is? Did you get it? It's Band-Aid brand. I am stuck on Band-Aid brand. Note that that is a song from probably 20 years ago. <laughs> so if you uh, were, might've been born after that song was released, but it sort of uh, permeates through media and you might have still heard it and it sticks in your mind enough to recall the product that it's selling. Let's do another one. I don't wanna grow up. Can you get that? It's Toys R Us, which is actually going out of business. So this is really a very arcane example um, if you could get it, that either means that you're from an older generation and you can remember that jingle or that you've heard it so many times through media that it's really um, ingrained itself into your mind. Let's do it one more. Most of you probably have it by now. Right. If you didn't get it by now, you're probably not going to get it. That's Pokemon. And I would guess probably the majority of the younger viewers out there probably needed five or six seconds to actually remember that one. So what I'm trying to get at is it doesn't take much information at all for you to immediately think of a product or for you to immediately um, retrieve all of the information associated 
with that product. That's how brand identities work. Let's do a few more fast paced ones. So I'm just going to show you a slogan and I want you to think in your mind what it represents. Ready? What's this? And this? And this? And this? And this? Okay. As you can see, <laughs> I gave you a second to recall the brand associated with each of those slogans and you probably got most of them. That's because you have been so fully saturated and exposed to this information. You can recall the brand, lots of feelings associated with that brand from an instance, from their slogan, not necessarily from their product. And that's also how logos work. They're created to have such a strong visual component that they immediately tell you that you're a brand. And I would guess you could probably, even the, with the ones that don't have the names on here, you could probably tell me what all of these, these different um, logos represent. So that's really the power of this availability heuristic for things like companies, where if they can get in front of you so many times that you can recognize their brand from six seconds of audio or for one obscure slogan or from just a picture, then they have you. That means you will have positive associations with their company because they're so easy to remember. They're so available in your mind. Okay, summary here. Availability heuristic is when we use how easy it is to recall something rather than type two processing. Essentially what's happening here is we're not thinking about how good a product is. That's kind of a hard calculation. You have to compare and contrast and you know do, do a harder mental process. Instead, we substitute for something easier, which is how easy is it to recall something. We don't evaluate that YouTuber's value of her content, we think about how easy it is to recall her. And that's what we associate with value. And unfortunately, things that are easier to remember will also seem more likable, more true, easier to understand, and more important. So I hope that you consider the impact of the things that you're being exposed to in your daily lives and try to evaluate if you really want them to have that type of impact on you or not. Mm -hmm.